All right, so now it's time. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to um, uh, University of Maryland uh, Quantum Matter Journal Club. Today, we are welcoming the speaker, um, Dan Sokratov, uh, who's uh, the second year student in the Professor Jean-Pierre uh, Paglioni's group doing experimental condensed matter physics. Um, specifically, he's um, doing research in the uh, strongly correlated materials, such as the um, europium aluminum four, um, and discover the charge density wave induced by pneumatics. Um, so today he's gonna talk about the topics uh, related to his research. Um, and uh, that's about electronic pneumaticity. Yeah, um, take it over Dan. Cool, yeah. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Dan and yeah, I'm gonna give a brief introduction to electronic pneumaticity. So the outline of the stock is we're gonna talk about what pneumaticity even is. Um, generally, this is a term used uh, when referring to liquid crystals, but there's a analog to electronic pneumaticity. I'm gonna talk about a few useful models that are usually theoretically employed. Uh, we're gonna briefly talk about iron-based superconductors because that's kind of the, the common field of research where pneumaticity is discussed. Uh, then I'm gonna talk about how to measure pneumaticity. Um, and then my, uh, not expertise, but what I work on more frequently is strain. So I'll talk about strain on iron-based superconductors, and then we will conclude with the talk. Okay, so in liquid crystals, uh, there's, there's quite a variety of phases, but this is the very generic diagram. So if we start in the crystalline liquid, uh, liquid phase, as you increase temperature, you can start partially breaking uh, translational, sorry, you can start partially restoring translation invariance. Hello. Uh, so going into a smectic phase, then once you go into a pneumatic, increasing the temperature even more, you fully restore translational invariance. So all the, um, all the positions of the atoms are pretty random when you consider the like center of mass, but the rotational symmetry is still broken. And then as you increase the temperature even more, you go into a full isotropic crystal. Can you only break the translational uh, invariance, but not the rotational? Can you only break translational, but not the rotational? Yeah, yeah that, is, that is what is happening here. We're not breaking rotational. Pneumatic? Which one? Yeah, for, bo for both smectic and pneumatic phases. You are not breaking rotational. Rotational symmetry is still preserved. Uh, so what's the difference between... Sorry, rotational symmetry is still broken. So if... Yeah, so what, what yeah. I'm asking is, can you, can you not break rotation, but only break translation? Not break rotation, but only break translation. Or, yeah, or the, the temperature, the, the energy scale is just... Um, too, too large for that to happen. I'm not too sure in, in terms of liquid crystals. Uh, I, I've never seen it happen. I think it always follows this kind of pattern. So, I mean, uh, going from left to right. To yes. Left, you have, sorry, I, can't, I just saw the message in Slack. The crystal, that's like a crystal is you, that is kind of right. That's you break the symmetry translational. Yes. Yeah, so both phase, both right? translational and rotational symmetries are broken in the crystalline phase. Right. Or, or, or maybe not. Or, or reduced. Might be like it's reduced, right? Like you have certain rotations that are still. So so okay. What I mean by those phases are broken is there there are preferred directions, right? If you look at an sure. isotropic liquid, you can rotate the system in any way. It still looks the same. Right. And same with any translation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so it, this might look ordered, but there is actually a, a, a broken rotational symmetry, for example, right? It, it prefers to align along a certain axis. That is a broken symmetry, because otherwise- Why is it supposed to like free space, right? Or, well, free right, so where it's allowed to just be in any direction. All the Correct. No matter what. Yes. And here it's like, it's the same, only in certain specific so I guess, operations you have that. Yeah. So, but the thing, between the, the middle two, the smectic, smectic and the matic. So I don't really see at least I'm not really sure what the distinction is. But. Yeah. So for the smectic, I believe there is translational invariance 
along a certain axis. There's like a preferred axis that it is still, um, yeah, you still have translational invariance. Then in the pneumatic phase, you're, it, it's just, it's completely like isotropic except with still broken rotational symmetry. Mm -hmm. So there is a specific orientation in space. But that they want to align with. Along, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the same. Oh, okay. Well, looks, I mean, the difference between symmetric and pneumatic is a continuous versus just discrete. Yes. Kind of it's, if I'm looking at the vertical axis. Yes. Okay. okay. Anyway, I don't want to get stuck here yeah. too much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so there is some analog to electronic crystals. So if we care about strongly correlated electron systems, we want something similar. Uh, we're not going to worry about the symmetric phase. Even the pneumatic phase is like, it's a little shady. It's not a true pneumatic phase as we're talking about in, in liquid crystals. It's more just we're breaking rotational symmetry. Okay, so what is pneumatic ordering? Uh, we're breaking some electronic rotational symmetry. Uh, so for a, if we limit it to 2D, you can have like a tetragonal material. So it's, it's a D4H point group. The two allowed ways you can do that if we start the uh, green wind zone like this, you can distort along the X or the Y directions. This is the B1G channel, or you can kind of distort along this combination, the B2G channel. Mm -hmm. This will be important in the future because these are basically the, in, in tetragonal crystals, these are the two strange directions we can actually try applying. So like in position space, this kind of also corresponds to like squeezing it. Yes. In one, okay. Yes. Yeah. So the B1G will be, you know, pulling this way. If I have, if I have like a P as a stack, it's going to expand this way okay. or contract this way. I just glued the material parallel to the axes of the P as a stack. Like if you look at like a unit cell of a crystal, like if, just like a cubic or something, it's some of the dimensions are held intact, but then the other ones are... Yeah, so, so for a cubic, I would keep C intact, but I would contract, like, say, B, and then lengthen A for the uh, B1G. So, uh, hi, Dan. So for the unbroken phase, is it on the S wave or a P wave or D wave, et cetera? Like, what is the um, orbital angular momentum state uh, for the unbroken phase? If you do not stretch it, S wave, I believe. S wave? I think so. Okay, cool. So you're saying by stretching it, um, it's some sort of a combination of D wave or something, D wave or F wave? Because you, you're saying the um, off diagonal and off diagonal part that looks like some sort of a, um, D X Y or D X squared minus Y squared, something like that. Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. Okay, okay, cool. So these are these just a free game. Uh huh. Free. Yes. Uh, not free. I think we're gonna share. It. Oh, right, right. But I mean, like, <laughs> this is for. Yeah. Everyone. Okay. Yeah, for everybody. Cool. Yes. Thanks. Okay. So one important thing is that um, electronic anisotropy can drive structural distortions in the crystals. So for example, if, if I'm measuring, um, I have some resistivity difference between XX and YY directions, sorry. Yeah, XX and YY directions, that's electronic anisotropy, that can uh, lead to these distortions in the crystals. So that would be something like pneumatic fluctuations um, that can lead to different, maybe the onset of pneumatic order, but also it can, it can have different effects on the crystal. Wait, are you saying driving uh, a current through one direction will change the crystal crystal mean theory? So no, uh, that no. Um, having so okay, having a Fermi surface distortion okay. will well, lead. The Fermi surface will not get modified by driving a current. Correct. Okay. Okay. But structure. What I'm saying is structural distortions can cause Fermi surface distortions and vice versa. If I have a Fermi surface distortion, I will necessarily have some structural distortion that yeah. results from it. Yeah, uh, that's basically uh, talking about the last point I made. If you have the onset of electronic pneumatic order, you necessarily also have to have a structural phase transition. You can theoretically limit, and I will talk about the Pomeranchuk instability in a second, but you can, you can theoretically limit it so that the, the lattice 
you know, is infinitely stiff. But for any realistic system, if you have the onset of pneumatic order uh, for electrons, you must have a structural phase transition. So that's one of the ways you can measure it. And if you see structural phase transitions in your sample, you might be expecting to see pneumatic fluctuations present as well. I mean, isn't so like you're thinking of like a Fourier transforms, right? Like you're talking about the distortions in the K space. Mm -hmm. like that has to have distortions in the yes. space, right? Yes. Because they're related. Yes. By, okay. And uh, just to clarify a little bit, so a lot of the time, uh, these phases will break rotational and some other symmetry. We call them pneumatic anyway. That's not technically correct. They're not purely pneumatic phases, but close enough, they have some pneumatic component and still worth discussing. So are we saying there are two phase transitions, uh, two structural phase transitions that I can observe? One going from uh, crystal to symmetric, and the other from symmetric to, uh, to pneumatic. Can you observe these two? In liquid crystals, yes. Okay. In real crystals, I don't think there is such a thing as a symmetric phase. In fact, there, I mean, the pneumatic phase, once again, it's like, it's a useful analog. There's not a real pneumatic phase that your crystal will go into. It's just like, it's a, it's a useful analogy because you have some breaking of rotational symmetry that you previously had, uh, which, which shows up as several different order parameters. You will see it in like well, charge there, order. You will see there, it. In is there a phase transition? There is a phase transition, yes. Okay, okay. Then, then it's a well-defined phase. It is a well-defined phase, yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, this is not a very new idea. It is now newly applied to, uh, you know, like iron-based superconductors, but this is something that was originally, like Fermi surface distortions, I mean, was something that was originally discussed like way before my parents were even born. So, um, Homer Anchuk, he's a Soviet physicist back in 1958, uh, was trying to talk about um, the stability in Fermi liquids. Uh, like what, under what conditions can the Fermi surface become unstable? So he uh, imagined some sort of distortion to the Fermi surface. Uh, you can decompose it into spherical harmonics. And if you go through the whole calculation, this is like, I linked it. This is a really, really short letter. It's like one page long. Cool. Um, you you get these results. So based on like whichever distortion you want will be a different symmetry, different L, right? So usually for solid state crystals, what I'm seeing is it's L equals two. That's the kind of distortion we usually see in the Fermi surface. So, so you're seeing. Uh, so you're kind of confirming that my initial guess that is. Kind of yes. Okay. Yes. So the common thing that I'm seeing, I'm not going to comment too much on this. Uh, I'm going to go through one paper, but I'm going to just show common results that people theoretically do with this. Uh, commonly, you just take the Hubbard model. So you have some kinetic term, some potential interaction term. Um, and what people find oftentimes is they want to see if there is some interplay of this Hermann-Truk instability and superconductivity in this model. And sometimes they see that it can enhance. Sometimes they see that there is competition between the phases. Um, it's still an interesting, uh, interesting topic to be like exploring. Is it ever the case where it does nothing? So it either enhances or detracts from or either? I think oftentimes it actually will do nothing. Usually it will do nothing. But in some interesting symmetries, there, there might be some competition or enhancement. So does it, does it all kind of matter on how the details of the distortion then? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so for a lot of the models that dive into iron-based superconductors, you start with the multi-orbital Hubbard model and you do whatever calculation you want. You may start in the like low energy regime and start with like the metal states and uh, do your calculations. You guys would honestly probably know way more about this than I do. Um, I'm gonna briefly go through some of the results of this uh, really good paper, uh, What Drives Pneumatic Order in Iron-Based Superconductors by Fernandez and all. Um, so they mentioned that in single crystals, when you have pneumatic ordering, necessarily you will see changes in structure. You'll see changes in spin. 
and in charge and orbital. So if you just write down the um, free energy equation, you know, you have all three of these parameters. The important thing is that let's say one of these parameters is the ultimate driving force behind the onset of thematic order. Let's say it's structure. It doesn't really matter which one. And let's call that psi one. So what you would expect, and chi one would be like the corresponding susceptibility, right? So what you would expect is if you go below the, um, the transition temperature, it will, your, your susceptibility will diverge. And then below it, sorry, at, at the transition, you have divergence of the susceptibility. Below it, the parameter is going to be negative. So you have some form of solution. The problem is that as soon as you have these, uh, these lambda ijs, the lambda 1, 2, and lambda 1, 3, if they are non-zero and you have some primary order parameter, as soon as you go below this transition temperature, all of the other orders will also happen. So experimentally, this causes an issue because you, know, you might think, OK, I think structure, structural distortions are what drives this thematic order. Well, you can't separate them ever from the other orders. You will measure it. All three will happen below this temperature. All three order parameters will immediately be non-zero. So, so what is that? You know, I'm looking at this as like that's like I would the only thing I'm really familiar with would be something like f of just psi say with one order parameter, mm -hmm. and I can think of some examples of like physically what you know what that order parameter is supposed to be. Like say like for boson like condensation, it's the the wave function of the the ground state. Mm -hmm. But so so like I don't know is it like when you have multiple coexisting order parameters. I don't know. I have no intuition for what that kind of a system that's like. There are physical interpretations for those three uh, order parameters. Yeah, so each one will correspond to each one of these, right? Uh, and each one has like a different driving mechanism. So for structure, you might have it's like some phonon coupling you might have, right? Phonon interactions. Um, for charge, you might have like something for spin you might have some something like spin ordering that might later lead to like a spin density wave right. okay etc okay like so um, just confirm yes is this 1d or 2d or this is 2d 2d i think okay yeah because i was wondering um whether it's legitimate to separate spin and charge the spin charge uh, separation has some um, restrictions, say for 1D, for like uh, <clears throat> strongly correlating electrons, you can have spin charge separation, but I'm not sure um, the background is and whether it's legitimate to. I don't know myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I recently read something about that and it sounded wacky, right? Like the, the spin and orbital degrees of freedom like behave almost. Is it independent particles? Or yeah. Whatnot? Yeah, I think under only under certain requirements that um, B and C order parameters are independent, mm -hmm. or otherwise you cannot easily separate them. That's that's my interpretation. I see. Yeah, I sadly have no input on this. Um, but what I will say is that which one of these is the, if there is a primary driver behind the onset of a nematic phase does actually have consequences. So what this paper will go through is um, experimentally, it's been kind of ruled out that structural is the driving one. So the choice is still, you know, it, it's difficult to figure out, but it could be spin or it could be orbital. Um, and the results of this paper that I don't fully understand, sadly, are that uh, depending on which one it is, it would prefer a different superconducting state. So I believe the spin one would be S wave and the uh, orbital one would be D wave. So how would you identify the primary one? I, I thought the phase transition happened for all three. Yes. Right? So how, how would, would you identify which one is the primary one? Yeah. <laughs> I think it depends on the scale of the coupling constants, right? Like if we have very large um, chi one or a very large B or something, then 
we're going to have some dominant um, dominant by one as the other parameter. And say, if we assume uh, lambda one, two, lambda one, three, they are much smaller than. So theoretically, you can just impose that one of them is the dominant one, right? Yeah. Experimentally, could I don't know how to confirm this. Could you explain what is dominant? It, it, it's. So that's the free energy, right? Yes. So by dominant. That's the largest free energy. Well, yeah, it gives the biggest. Here, here, I guess we're saying that the free energy is, let's just say it's a function of three different order parameters. And okay. it, I guess it should be like analytic, right? The free energy, it sounds like it should be analytic, which means you can expand it in a Taylor series. And then based on all the, you know, you have the general Taylor series and by the choice of the coefficients, some are more dominant. To, to contribute more. So, so, so my understanding is that something these, these parameters that is unentangled between the uh, the water parameters. So just for example, just B, not right. not, uh, not lambda one two. Is that is that the Yeah. So if for the driving one, let's say it's lambda one or lambda two, whichever. Uh, for the driving one. Its corresponding coefficient, the susceptibility, is going to diverge at the transition. The other ones will not diverge, right? They will just have some positive value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's another way of interpreting this, like mathematically. Um, say here we only have some bilinears and some fourth order terms, right? Yeah. So for the bilinears, we can easily write down as um, we can diagonalize that, right? Like so, we have a matrix in the middle. Yeah which has some um, uh, eigenvalues. Yeah, whichever has the largest eigenvalues will correspond to the major contribution to the phase transition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and then for the full order term, we'll treat, treat that as a perturbation. Um, same thing for um, for phi two to the fourth, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my understanding. So, Yes. Before we go on, you showed the, the Hubbard model previously. Yes. Is this, a, you know, is this possible with the Hubbard model? I think I'm a little confused about that. I think that's what this paper is doing with the Hubbard model. Okay. Can, can you go back to the Yes. Answer? I think this is the very basic Hubbard model. I don't. Okay. So they're expanding upon. So yes. It seems like this, you know, requires. No, I think. That, I, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think this is way too simple. This okay. is just like literally the Hubbard model. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I was, yeah. I was really confused how any of these. Uh, no, 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 no. Come out. Yeah, yeah. It okay. it gets more complicated than that. How is this fermionic? Maybe a stupid question. <laughs> how is this fermionic? No, I mean, why? I don't see. Like C and C down, they are both fermionic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're fermionic. Um, why why do you define a fermionic model instead of a bosonic model? So if you, um, so you know the spins can be written as, um, as a second class operator, right? Okay. So um, yeah, definitely for a model, for a simple model, either it's Poisonic or it's fermionic, you can rewrite it in terms of spin operators, um, like the, and write down the effect of Hamiltonians. Okay. And you will see that for different continuity relations, the coefficient, the sign of the coefficients in front of the fermionic or bosonic Hamiltonians will be different. Say, for example, um, for the ground state of a Hamiltonian, if you are having like fermionic, you may have anti ferromagnets. Right. Uh, for the bosonic, you may have like ferromagnets. Um, because we have experiments, right? right? At least we know that what the ground state looks like. So, yeah, what does the ground state look like? Um, for that, I'm not sure, but <laughs> obviously. Obviously, I think this tends more to the anti fermionics, uh, right? So, therefore, like uh, the uh, some fermionic model may be more suitable. How, how, how can you see that in you know, the manic phase that is anti fermionic? Because there's there's no, it's not a vector bundle. It is a, uh, it is an RPM, RPM uh, bundle rather than. For that, I don't know. know. Um, yeah. Like naively, I, I I may think that experimentally we can we can um uh, we can observe the directions which correspond to the spin operators and see whether they tend more. We can see the correlation functions, 
And we're gonna see whether they tend more to align with each other or anti-align with each other. Yeah, but, but I don't think them. there's a well-defined spin here because there's no there's no arrow. There's only a line. Right? There, there's no innate direction to to where this this line point at. I think there is, right? A line for the yeah, nematic phase. For for nematic phase, there's it's not an arrow that is underlying in the in the group. Well, so the, the nematic phase again, what is that refers to the orientation of the of the atoms? No, it, it's it's the orientation of the electrons, right? So when you so orientation of the electrons, what about like just their so like in a like the crystalline phase, like uh, the electrons are in the ground state arrayed periodically. So is that are you referring to their spatial positioning, the wave function? Or is it the, the spins? Or are, you for, are we talking about the spins here? Yeah, so, so na naively, no. Oh, naive, oh um, here's the thing. So when you're talking about uh, the, when you're using the Hubbard model and want to see whether it's fermionic or bosonic, you have to put it into the ground state. Right. I think for here for the ground state, the most standard ground state is, for, is, um, is the crystalline phase. Right. In, in, in that case, I think you have a well-defined spin and etc. So if you go back to the previous speaker, uh, where you draw the nematic phase, yeah, go, go back, way back. Yeah, 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 right here. There's no arrow, right? It's a, it's a, it's a line. There's no preferred direction to, to where it's pointed up or down. Uh, that, is that, that is the assumption no, there, there, there is right that that's the point okay well, I mean, then is, this is innately different than the nematic crystal this is a classification yeah. system um because there is a preferred direction to where up it is yes if you add the spin degrees freedom then i think you can definitely so it, is that find... real freedom present in, in this model I think they made it, uh, yeah, in the Hubbard model uh, that you showed the later slide. Um, yeah, you see, there's I and sigma. So I uh, I means the orbital or, or the spatial degree of freedom. Sigma means degree, uh, spin degree of freedom. So yeah. here they, they indeed include the, the spin. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but there's no over the same spin. No, it's two, it's it's spin half, right? yeah, yeah. electrons to its yeah, any, it, there's two states up and down. Yes, so arbitrary, okay, yeah, okay. I mean, you pick a z direction, you know, you could pick, I mean, you could, there's always gonna be two spin states, yeah. But I mean, so, so the, whole, not, the whole, I, I thought the whole idea of nematicity is that you know, the, the spin states are not conserved, I, I don't not, you know, this, you can't can't over this is the first I'm hearing about nematicity. <laughs> Uh, maybe we should proceed. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> discuss later. Yeah, so um, I think everyone clear with the uh, free energy part? That's yeah. This yeah. Left over. yeah, okay. And again, just to, so just to refresh the name, the nomadic phase that had so it's uh, got trans, it has translational symmetry, but not. Rotational. Yes. Okay. Rotational symmetry gets broken. Okay. okay. So, briefly, uh, let's talk about iron based superconductors, nematicity in them. Uh, here's a beautiful phase diagram of what is happening in a bunch of these iron based superconductors. So, you have some superconducting domes on both the hole and the electron sides. You have uh, region where nematic fluctuations become strong, and then you have like actual onset of a nematic phase. You have some stripe magnetism in the middle, and you have this region of C4 rotational symmetry, right? Which will not overlap with the nematic fluctuations. Um, that would be breaking C4 rotational symmetry. Um, so in iron-based superconductors, through strain measurements, they basically showed that the Anisotropy and resistivity, the ratio is something like 500 to the anisotropy with lattice parameters. So likely there is something that is driving nematic order that then is resulting in a structural uh, phase transition, but not the other way around. The structural phase transition is not the thing driving it. 
And basically, um, here you can see like the, the resistivity, sorry, the derivative of this uh, resistivity and isotropy, which is defined here, rho x x minus rho x rho y y. Uh, this derivative to, with respect to the um, order parameter fields, like one of the, one of the fields defined here, that diverges near the pneumatic transition, uh, which means that the order parameter cannot be the driving one because the field is like the field is that this has to be the what is it the conjugate field to the order parameter, so it cannot be the primary driving order parameter. This is kind of confusing to me. But basically the result is that we're trying to figure out whether the spin or the charge slash orbital are the driving uh, parameters between, sorry, in, in iron-based superconductors for these pneumatic fluctuations. And structure is something that just results from it. And as this paper claims, depending on which one is the driving one, so if it's the charge or the orbital fluctuations, you will get, um, the system will prefer an S-wave state for the superconducting state. Uh, whereas if, um, if it's spin fluctuations, then it will prefer a D-wave state for superconductivity. So this is, this is a relatively important question to figure out. If you can prove that one of these orders is the driving mechanism between, behind the pneumatic fluctuations in the system, you can also <coughs> suggest that um, you know, your, your superconducting state is S-wave or D-wave. <clears throat> yes. But up until this last bullet point, yes. we haven't really thought about superconductivity at all. We have not. So but like I mentioned, that come in? well, superconductivity is something that is in a lot of these systems that we care about. Pneumatic fluctuations. Is... Yeah, but I'm, 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 I think I'm starting to understand this implication in the last bullet point that, that somehow a charge fluctuation favors some S-wave superconductor while an orbital fluctuation favors some D-wave superconductor. Why, why is the driving parameter Import the superconductivity. Yeah, so I I think the way it would work is uh, you you have you have your superconducting phase. Um, if you have different order parameters driving that superconducting phase, okay. um, those order parameters can also be driving the pneumatic phase as well. So mm -hmm. if one of them is preferred, then that would suggest that. It, it, it could also be the driving mechanism behind superconductivity. Okay. Alternatively, there's competition between nematicity and the superconducting order. If one of them is like suppressed, then the superconducting order can increase, like, like the TC transition can increase if that, Okay. yeah. Oh, okay. So there is some complicated interplay that like everyone that's playing with the Hubbard bundle is trying to figure out whether it is okay. you know, competing, enhancing, et cetera. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Very, it's still an open question. It's still a question. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So just to clarify, from like my fluctuation, it's like charge or real fluctuation. You can see like little changes in like the electronic density, like in infinitesimal changes versus like little infinitesimal spin flips. Yeah. In the system. Spin flips in the system would be here, right? Okay. Uh, so they are the spin. Yeah, you, you might have like, like some magnetic, some magnetic. you might have some like local spin ordering happening right, okay. in your system. Okay. That doesn't necessarily lead to a full like charge density wave, not the full order on the entire like crystal lattice, but just like local spin ordering. Okay. And then like charge or that does like in electronic density, something similar, just changes in the electronic density. I think so. Okay. Okay. So then like um I was trying to think like, uh, well, I was trying to think, you know, got to think, I don't have to try to think. Um, so it's like, so the electronic wave function, right, made by electronic wave function, has got to be anti-symmetric. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, typically that's, you know, either you take care of that in the space part or the spin part, right? So I was wondering if, if there's any like connection there, like between the, the two, the two different types of fluctuations leading to like, so S wave, right? That to me sounds like, a, yeah, I don't know about many bots, so just for an atom, right? S wave is like kind of symmetric space yes. part. And then 
versus the, uh, I guess, what is it, D wave that also, am I also? SPD, D is also symmetric. Damn, never mind. I, never mind. Any more questions here? I'm going to briefly talk about. Um, so in in this paper, they're going to talk about uh, assuming that the like magnetic order, like assuming a magnetic model, that's what's driving the pneumatic fluctuations. And then they all, they're also going to talk about charge orbital. But is there, could, sorry, go ahead. is there a reason that this only applies in the ejection zone? Uh, yeah, I was about to ask, can you speak to the asymmetry of this between the electron and the whole doping? I cannot speak to the asymmetry of this. Uh, yeah. Well, I, it is something that is very confusing I, I, to me as well. I'm assuming yeah. is, is this is numerically calculated? Uh, yeah. I mean, also, also all of these phases, you can, like, over time, you can just experimentally find. And so this is the true thing, right? Yeah. You know, right? I mean, I, okay, okay. So, so this is this is a schematic. It's not, you know, true, yeah. true, but yeah. This is experimentally measured. This is like a confirmed phase diagram. Uh, but now we're just trying to understand the interplays between the phases in there. I guess so it's like the pneumatic even touches that superconductivity. Right? Yeah, That's and kind of cool. I guess through the computing phase, this happens a lot. Oh, oh, is so is the is that what the dotted line mean? That there's like a yeah, there's a coexistence. Yeah, in the yeah. biography, there's there's also this kind of competing phase mm -hmm. with the uh, superconductivity and uh, yeah. modeling the way with, with like the where they take the two uh, graphing sheets and yeah. twist it. Yeah. 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 Cool. So this is kind of uh, very usual. Okay, so they take a magnetic model. From my understanding, the um, motivation behind taking a model like this is uh, basically in most RMB superconductors, this is what is experimentally measured. So they take this model, um, uh, they do some calculations on it. I wish I could explain to you what kind of calculations, but <laughs> alas. Um, so normally, from mean field, you would expect the Z2 and the O3 symmetries to be broken at the same time at the magnetic transition. So what is Z2? Z2 would be the, the uh, tetragonal symmetry, right? So like you can rotate 90 degrees oh, in your so system. Yes. And O3 would be the, uh, the, the, the spin orbital rotational symmetry. And there are AB subletters floating in, in the sun. Yes. Uh, uh, and the, uh, uh, is this showing the ground state? Is this, I mean, the spin direction? Is this the ground state? Spin direction. This? Yeah. I think so. Hmm. Okay. Uh, let me just to confirm. Uh, can you, what's, why is the Z2 uh, instead of Z4? It, the crystal has tetragonal symmetry. Oh. Um, when that like make it see which, are you saying that it's only broken on one direction instead of all four directions like, like yeah. what's the no, I think okay okay i see then for the o3 symmetry why is it o3 instead of so3 do, do you guys have any idea um So I mean, in, they, in some ways, reflections are, you know, the yeah. chirality is preserved. So I think that's, I mean, chirality symmetry is here. I mean, not chirality in here. So O3 is the something. Theory. So doesn't the S, doesn't that basically just say we're only going to care about the ones with the turn at plus one rather than yeah. plus or minus one? So only proper, say, rotation. Like no reflections. But I think right. reflection symmetry is, is valid. Wait, what is this thing? What is M? What is M? Yeah. Magnetization? So it's one. Yeah. So there's there's two there's M1 and M2 lattices. Yes. These are the green and the yellow lattices. So does this represent like little domain, like you're saying little domain line domains? You feel like M you have green and yellow, are these like 
small little domains of magnetization in one way or the other? I think this is a lattice of iron atoms yeah. in in the iron-based superconductors. They split into, yeah, I guess they split into these domains. Uh, okay. Wow. Okay. Wait, wait, so, so that, that is my understanding. Is that it a could be wrong. or uh, is this a, a, a UV uh, limit lattice or, or is this already RD? I don't know. Oh, okay. So here, what? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm still puzzled about the O3 instead of SO3. So here we do not need to. Uh, so here we are, are. Are we keeping the length of uh, during the during the rotation or Because because well, I mean, so the difference between O three and S O three is just determinant minus one matrices. Right? Yes, which are just reflection. So the length of anything is still preserved yes. even under O three. Yeah. So you're saying that here the reflection is still uh, so reflection. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that's the, that's the point of O3. Everybody, okay, but we're breaking O3 symmetries. Wow. We're, keep, we're keeping O3, we're breaking Z2, right? Wait, um, wait. so like that last bulk one breaking the Z2 and O3? So they will both be broken once you uh, go into the C magnetic, right? Once you, once you go below here. But pneumatic okay. fluctuations, so okay, normally, if you forget about pneumatic fluctuations, you will just have this T magnetic, both Z2 and O3 are going to be broken. Once you have pneumatic fluctuations, you get this intermediary phase where you're breaking Z2, but O3 is kept, which is exactly the pneumatic phase. And so again, the pneumatic phase. So, there's, so basically what they're saying is, hey, let's assume that magnet magnetism is the primary driving force. It results in a pneumatic phase. They're like, hey, okay. So I'm trying to like relate this back now. So the pneumatic phase is kind of like you have know, preferred orientation space, but not like for place. the electrons, right? So it's not it's not for the lattice, which is confusing yeah, to me yeah, as well. Yeah, right, right, right. It's like the <laughs> electrons form their kind of lattice, right? Right, right. So you start with the lattice and you put the like you throw the electrons on top and they there's kind of they form right, it's related, right? But it's not exactly the same thing. So so with the electrons, okay, when you say, okay, so the electrons have preferred orientation space, is this referring to their spin orientation? Yeah, I assume so. Okay, okay. Um, I don't see, yeah. I was trying to relate that to the, the keeping the O3 symmetry, but breaking the two. Here, are you growing the unit cell? But, uh, I don't think this is one magnetic unit cell. You, you're talking about this? Right. Actually, this is one magnetic unit cell. I, do, I don't think this whole thing is the one magnetic unit cell. Mm -hmm. And I guess there, are, there would be like overlapping unit cells, right, for uh, each of the lattices. Well, so a reflection, say on the many electron wave function, right? A spatial reflection that doesn't affect their spin, right? Can you that's a I mean when we talk about like O3, o we're not doing or even SO3, you're not doing anything to the spin part of the wave function, right? Uh, I think that is what it's referring to. O3? It is about the yeah, it's about the electron spin. Yeah, they, uh, so is, if, if I'm understanding this correctly, it's a Z2 symmetry is the lattice symmetry. Yes. O3 symmetry is a spin symmetry. Yes, yes. It's a local Correct. Symmetry. A local symmetry. Symmetry. Yeah, yeah. It's a local well, it's, well, yeah, it's, I mean, I don't know if it's a gauge symmetry. You can say local. It's still a global symmetry, right? Yeah, I think the, the total symmetry will be the cross. Oh, no. Yes, Z2 cross O3. Z2 cross O3. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, can I you repeat what you said about the difference between the pneumatic phase, with, like with regards to this, the difference between the pneumatic phase and um, the not pneumatic phase? The not pneumatic you phase. You mentioned something. One, one of these, one of these symmetries breaks. Symmetric? Yes, the Z two. 
No, forget about the smectic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> forget about the so smectic. The symmetry yes. Work. So that means so here I have a ninety degree rotational symmetry, right? Okay. Here I only have one eighty. Okay. So yes. So previously I had I had a tetragonal lattice, so I expect a ninety degree rotational symmetry. Okay. And I so get I get a phase where that is broken. And so this lower phase is the nomadic phase. Yes. So the in in between phase in between the nomadic transition temperature and the magnetic, I will have the nomadic phase. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when the when the C2 phase is not broken. Do the spins uh, point in the C direction instead of uh, series X, Y direction? When it is. I mean, it's for those three symmetries. It doesn't really matter what direction. Yeah. There is nothing that chooses a direction for them, right? And then in the nomadic phase, th there's still nothing that chooses a direction for them. The O3 is still preserved. But then when you when you go into the magnetic phase, then O3 will be broken. You have some preferred direction, right? And, and this chi on the z-axis is that susceptibility? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it, it's just I, I think it's just the magnitude of yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I think we're good to go to the next. Slide. Okay, sounds good. Um Hopefully we can. Hopefully things will get easier from now on. Uh, <laughs> in regards to questions, so there's, you know, it, a way for you to measure the pneumatic order parameters. Anything that would be susceptible to electronic anisotropy. So there's there's a ton of measurement techniques for it. Uh, the one I'm most familiar with is the twin resistivity, but you can do like Raman or NMR or X-ray or magnetic torque, um, ARPES. <laughs> Sorry. What is this? What is the first? Detwinned resistivity. Yeah. So, so um, that's basically strain, right? You're measuring resistivity of a sample, but you're also straining it. You're detwinning. Oh, you're detwinning potential domains. And then how I. Can, how are we going to guarantee that uh, the sample doesn't break when you are straining it? You don't guarantee that. <laughs> Your sample will sometimes break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you strain it hard enough, it will. Break. It will break. Yeah. Okay. Do you ever have to like to look at like the stress strain curves and all of your in these materials? Yeah, okay. yeah. Cool. Um, a lot of the time. How do you how do you measure strain? Yeah. So yeah. you have um. So I, I'll talk about this in a bit, uh, but basically you so you put it on a piezoelectric material where if you apply some voltage across it, it's gonna compress or elongate, right? You also, on the same piezoelectric stack, you have a strain gauge. You're, you're, you're straining your sample using a piezoelectric material. Yes. Oh, I thought you just physically strain. If you have a 2D material, you just send to, to, to wafer. No, but you, you, always have, you always have some, um, you always have some C component, right? You always have some bulkness to your crystal. Right. I'm not. I'm not growing 2D crystals. I'm growing bulk 3D crystals. These are all uh, bulk 3D uh, measurements. Uh, these are all 3D. Yes. So I'm, I'm. I mean, I'm trying to reduce the dimension as much as I can, but it will inevitably like still hundreds. Well, I, I know in 2D people are try just bending the wafer in that way. Mm. In 3D, I actually. I mean, it's also like. Can you do that under temperature? How would you? How would you bend the? How do you do that? I mean, when you load the when you load the sample, uh, you you can. Uh, are you are you asking how do you put in put it in the fridge? I think you you would need a, a particular uh, modified wafer to do that. Okay. And a modified mounting. Uh, yeah. uh, I I've never done. That. I I've heard other labs done. Yeah, I don't actually know how to do strain on 2D crystals. Um, I imagine you can try doing it the same way as you do on 3D crystals, but there will, yeah, anyway. And then at the bottom, I put RUS, uh, resonant ultrasound spectroscopy, something I don't know very much about, but it's kind of a relatively new technique that is very interesting. I think it gives you very similar information to what uh, your strained resistivity can give you. So you're you're trying to get like, Elastic resistance coefficients from that, our US can 
give you those as well. I, I don't fully know how the technique works, but I'm, I'm imagining that you can also uh, use it to detect nematicity. So, okay, anisotropic strain, as I mentioned before, it's a conjugate field of nematicity. Uh, and it's also very, you know, very simple to realize experimentally. You have your sample, we're gonna put it on a piezoelectric, it's really easy to do. Um, so the linear response of, of the anisotropic strain is proportional to the pneumatic susceptibility. You can define this last resistivity tensor. Um, I'm not gonna go through what everything here is, but basically like you have some resistivity difference between your strain sample and an unstrained sample. Um, and uh, the, the derivative in that with respect to strain can define this other resistivity tensor. Depending on the symmetry of your crystals, you can probe different coefficients in this tensor and some of them are like symmetry pro prohibited, et cetera. Um, so you can, you, can, you can find the pneumatic order parameter using this. Oh. Are, are you able to strain the sample in, in both directions? Yeah, so, okay. so simultaneously, no, you would, need, you would need a more complicated setup. Um, so hypothetically speaking, this is actually something I looked at. Uh, there, are, there are piezoelectrics that when you apply voltage across them, they'll, like, they'll bend. So what you can, you can think of doing is if you have two of these stacks and the material is slapped in, in between them, you, know, you can have some DC offset that bends it this way and then have them curve the other way. So, so yeah, that way you could do it simultaneously, but it's pretty complicated. And then you start introducing shear and it all gets like really weird and complex. So it, it's, it's not a thing that people normally do. If you, if you want to do RxX and then RxY, uh, you're usually going to have to either use two samples, like, you know, glue two samples on your piezo stack, or you're going to have to just redo the experiments. I mean, the, no, no, I, the, I, I guess, you know, control, right? Like, kind of control experiment, it's kind of, you know, if you do too much at once. No, no, I, I, I think, I think I, okay. I, I guess in the, in the linear limit, you can separate these two. Right. Exactly. But, but there, there, is possibly going to be a non trivial effect if you combine the two. That will create a Gaussian curvature, which is totally non trivial. It's just, um, I, I don't know how you would experimentally realize this. For, for any piezo stack, normally you, you want, I, I, don't, I, <laughs> I don't know if you can apply strain along both directions. I don't know how you would carefully measure that either. I think strain gauges are not calibrated towards that. That would be wonderful. If I could do that, that would be great. <laughs> I think it is just difficult to realize. Okay, so uh, what does what does the setup actually look like? Um, this I've never used myself, but it looks pretty similar. Uh, basically, the advantage to, against um, the advantage versus using one piezo stack is you have these three piezo stacks. The outside ones are connected together, and the inside one is where your sample is glued. Kind of, you can see the sample is like glued in between this and the um, like the body of the strain cell. Basically, you increase how much strain you're actually applying to the sample by doing the setup. Um, something that Cliff Hicks figured out a while back. Um, so instead of having something like, you know, several parts of a percent of strain, you can actually apply like four percent, ten percent strain to your crystal. Usually, that amount breaks it, but nonetheless, you can apply way more. Uh, up to a breaking point and get way more strain, um, which would help you extract the coefficients. And this is what it actually looks like. So this is the strain cell I was just talking about. You have these three uh, piezo stacks here. Uh, these two are connected together. You have a sample in the middle. Uh, this is not actually for like a resistivity strain measurement. This is for something else. It doesn't matter too much, but the setup is still the same. Um, and then here on the left, you can see what it would look like on a just regular piezo stack. So on one side, you have the strain gauge that's just there to like calibrate how much strain you're actually applying. It, it's basically a material that just has like a very, very well-known response to strain. Uh, so, you know, hopefully exactly how much you're applying to the crystal as well. Obviously there is some relaxation, but you assume that's pretty small. And then you, so part of the issue that it's difficult to apply RxX, uh, sorry, um, epsilon XX and then epsilon YY is that, um, sorry, epsilon XX, and then let's say epsilon XY, right? Because, oh. yes, yeah, yeah. so, so um, uh, it will be on this picture. Yeah, so let's say it's easy for me in the same experiment to stretch it this way and then stretch it that way. 
right, my crystal. But if I wanted to stretch it this way, I would have to take it off and then remount it onto the piece of the stack. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And uh, because I don't want my sample to fly off in the middle of a measurement, I have to add like epoxy to it. And the problem is with a lot of this epoxy, it like, you basically can't remove your sample afterwards safely. The sample is just destroyed. So you get one measurement, and if you need to measure uh, uh, epsilon x y, then you need a different sample, and you know complications arise. So you hope that the response is kind of similar, but yeah. Anyway, it's probably not. It is probably it is almost certainly not. Yes, <laughs> uh, but if you measure enough samples, you hope that you get a consistent response. You can you can talk about something useful. So um, coming back to uh, iron-based superconductors. Um, so we, we talked about like in tetragonal systems, what kind of strains we can apply. We can apply B1G, we can apply B2G, and there's also EG, which would be like in these parameters, it would be, what is it? Like, it's not a shear. It looks like a shear. Maybe it is a shear. Anyway, this one we can't do experimentally anyway. <laughs> so we're only left with B1G and B2G. Um, yeah, that's kind of like, that'd be the, like a rigid crystal. I don't, I don't know how you would do EG. I don't think you can. I think our US can actually give you EG or the, the coefficients that would be associated with EG, but I still don't understand how resonant really ultrasound, really? resonant ultrasound spectroscopy. Okay. I don't know how that works. And I hope to understand one day, cause it sounds, it sounds like my experiment just better in every way. <laughs> so <laughs> I want to learn how that works. Um, but it also seems like way more difficult to set up and do carefully, um, but it gives you way more information. So, okay, in this, in this uh, free energy expansion, you have, Psi is just some pneumatic order parameter. Uh, epsilon is strain. So if if we're assuming that the electronic nematicity is what's driving the structural transition, which is most pretty much confirmed in iron-based superconductors at this point, then this coefficient A will be temperature dependent. All the other ones are just going to be positive and temperature independent. Um, and the important thing is that this, this pneumatic order parameter is not uniquely defined. So anything that is susceptible to uh, electronic anisotropy can can function as this order parameter. That's why strain strain is nice. Okay, so once again, these are just the strains that I would be doing uh, on my tetragonal system. And in this case, I just wanted to show you guys briefly what the data looks like. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about it too much. This is in. Uh, it's not technically in an iron superconductor, but it is barium one to two, which has the same tetragonal symmetry as a lot of iron-based superconductors, and it's still kind of counted as part of the family. Um, so in this material, you have, you have a tetragonal phase, you have a transition into a monoclinic phase. Uh, and as you can see, you have a very strong response in the uh, B1G susceptibility, but you don't actually have that strong of a response in the B2G susceptibility at the transition. Um, and, you know, uh, Chris, if you want, you can look through some of his papers. He'll, he'll go through some explanations of why this could be true. Why B2G is not that sensitive, but B1G has this strong response. It also doesn't mean, I guess it doesn't, it's not really like a, what's it, singular there? It is not singular there, yeah. Versus the B1G? B1G is, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it won't, in, in any true experiment, you won't have like actual all the way divergence, but you have, oh, you have a right, kink. Oh, right, but it needs though. Yes. Like when you look at from the left and right, it yes. does this thing where it needs, like yeah. to the heat capacity. Like, like, that's to say this B, uh, B2G, I guess that's not a, there's no phase transition associated, associated order parameter, or, Or, uh, there's no phase transition with that associated order parameter. There's still a phase transit. There's still a pneumatic. Are these both are these two? Um, these are these the are just quantities, but the same. These are just different strain directions, right? So what we're seeing basically um, from this B two G B two G strain, I would get some coefficients of my elasticity tensor. Those coefficients don't reflect as much of a difference across this transition as do uh, the coefficients corresponding to B1G strain. 
So I think that, so to me, what that means is that um, the structural distortions prefer to be along these directions rather than these directions. Naturally in the crystal, when it goes into the triclinic phase, it wants distortions this way and not this way. Yeah, or, or even in terms as, so sort of if you if you write down free energy, um, the um, the uh, diagonal ones should be much larger than the off diagonal ones. I think that corresponds to the sort of um, response that that um, that shows up in your data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. So uh, in that case, if we only have um, B two G. We cannot assert that there is not a structural phase transition. Is that right? Well, we know that there is a structural phase transition. Yeah, yeah. Suppose we don't know. Suppose we just yes. see. Okay, okay. Uh, you see that, yeah. So, so the B2G is kind of like pinching from the corners and pull, pulling on it from the corners. Uh, yeah, so, so the way you can imagine it is so this is how the sample would be glued. And imagine that my piezoelectric is like this, mm -hmm. right? So I'm still pulling in the in the directions of the piezoelectric. Yeah. Just rotated, uh, yeah. Sample. But my sample is rotated. Now it has like a, yeah, like it has a mix of both uh, the x and the y. In some, so in some, um, in some iron-based superconductors, what? Okay, what I remember, and don't quote me on this, what I remember is that there are different twin domains and at certain temperatures there is different susceptibility to these different strain channels because sometimes some domain is preferred sometimes the other domain is preferred so you will have different responses to different strain channels but anyway that is not i don't think that is what is happening here good Okay, this was actually the end we got there. Uh, so even to this day in strongly correlated electron systems, uh, nematicity is still kind of an interesting topic, usually when it comes to interplay with other orders, other phases. So for example, superconductivity or maybe charge density wave, spin density wave, et cetera. Whatever order you want, nematicity could have interesting interplay with it. And there's still lots of unanswered questions. Um, so oftentimes it accompanies metamagnetic transitions in the presence of a magnetic field. That's what we talked about with the magnetic model. Uh, you know, it, it, it was a question relevant to cuprates. I am not sure. I think because cuprate research is kind of dying, it has been answered in cuprates. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm not too sure myself. On In iron-based superconductors, it's st we still don't know. We're pretty sure it's not the structural distortions that are driving the nematicity, but could, could still be some order, other order. And there's many more other systems. Like in my system, I don't actually have pneumatic ordering, but I believe I do have pneumatic fluctuations because the system is really, really susceptible to strain. And I have onset of charge density waves, um, which could be because of pneumatic fluctuations. Okay, and then um, like we mentioned, anything that is susceptible to electronic anisotropy should be a good measurement of the pneumatic order parameter because there's so many techniques that are you have many good ways to make sure that the, the phase does actually set in. And uh, yeah, like I mentioned, you don't have to have pneumatic order. The pneumatic fluctuations can still have important consequences on materials properties, like onset of other phases. Yeah. Okay, that is all. All right, let's Next. thank Dan for his uh, inspiring talk. It's difficult to have four contacts, then probably this would be much easier. If your sample has four contacts, yeah, this would be much easier. Then you can you can you don't have to unload the samples to to measure. Well, you uh, have to have four contacts always, right? Right. At the very least, you have to have four contacts. Yeah, you yeah, need yeah, two yeah. contacts to send resistance, to send current to to measure resistance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oftentimes, you want to have five, I guess. Yeah, more. You want yeah. hall and and do unplug or symmetrization. The problem is that. Um, you can only have like in in a in a in your measurement systems you can only have so many wires that you're effectively using. You need to give up four for. What is the <laughs> so normally you have uh let's see you have twelve right. Yeah. So you need uh, you need four for the strain gauge. Okay. Uh, you need some to send 
Well, actually, you, so you don't need those. You need four for the strain gauge. So hypothetically, you could have two samples on a PSS stack. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Or you can do one whole sample in a PSS stack, right? Right. So, so you can have a lot of contacts. You measure a lot of different directions. Uh, yeah. 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 That will be uh, like much more efficient. The problem is, so with with a uh, with a PSS stack, you're right. You can do that. You can measure multiple samples at the same time. With um, the Higgs mechanism set up with, uh, with this guy, yeah. uh, you you really need to accurately mount it in between these two plates. And you can't really do that with multiple samples. If you were to put it like here, you would have a different relaxation of strain that it, it, it just- I, you, I guess I'm just talking about one sample, but a, a lot of contacts. One sample, but a lot of contacts. Yeah, yeah to accurately measure different directions. Yeah, but uh, you still aren't applying strain in all the directions that you want, right? So, so you can you can do x x y y, but you can't do x y in the same in the same run, right? You see what I mean? Why not? Why not? Because you would need to rotate the crystal, right? You need to rotate which way you're straining it. So I would have to uh, physically lift it up and change the orientation of the crystal. Because uh, okay. the because the PS electric only goes. X, 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 you were saying so the first X being the strain direction, the second X being the measurement direction. Uh, I see. Okay. Then the whole, wait, then wait. Then, uh, that, right? No, 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 no. Both being okay. Wait. So. Here. So you you actually have three directions, right? Because whole conductivity is R X one. Yes. So it's, and there's another stranger. So, so you have three directions in your. So let's see. So this would be like, let's say this is epsilon xx. This would be epsilon yy. This is a strain direction. Yes, these are strain directions. So something like this, right? That would be xy. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So you, you have this direction. But yeah, you can, you can still have. You're right. right. Like when you're doing any of these, you can still have um, you can still have like you know your your uh, five contacts, right? So you have two current ones, and then you have these two will make these two will make RXX, and here you can measure RXY, right? Right. You can, yeah, you can measure whole while doing any of these trains. But my point is that. You're either stuck with epsilon xx, epsilon yy in the same run, yeah. or you can do epsilon xy. But you can't do that on the same crystal, unfortunately. I wish you could, but because it's physically like physically glued down, you have right, to right. rotate for, it. for this uh, epsilon xx. If your strain direction is epsilon xx, you can you can uh, you can find uh, r x y and r y x. And if yes. you have more contact, you can you can have more direction of your whole conductivity. Sure. Right. What well, more oh, contacts? Oh, is like... this is this where it has the innate uh, crystal structure? The, the, it does. The... Yes. Okay. So oh yeah yeah. So there there are a lot of directions. Yes. Okay. Now I understand. Any other questions? And that crystalline direction has an interplay with the strain direction. Yes, that is and very that important. Is... So. For, that is the reason you you make a lot of samples to yes. to test the the misalignment between these two. Yeah. So the good thing is when you look at a physical crystal, sometimes you get like really really sharp uh, directions on the crystal. Like you have you might have a random crystal that goes like you know looking down might look like this, but then it has like a really sharp direction here. And maybe like another. So I have a sharp corner. How do you grow the sample? Uh, depends on what you're going. A lot of times you do flux method or vapor transport. I didn't talk about it here, but MBE. I don't do MBE now. Uh, that would be 2D, right? So, so how, how do you grow the sample? So, so, so what is the method? Uh, like flux is a common method. Flux okay. growth. Oh, flux. So you you have you have some flux trans uh, some like transport. Sorry, some like bath of uh, material uh, that okay. eventually these crystals will form on. Does this give a, a clean method? <laughs> well, why don't you do MBE? I thought MBE would be a, a cleaner. 
and B would be great, but that that gives you two D samples, right? Oh, okay. You, you want I want I want bulk, bulk single crystals. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. yeah I, I mean, I'm sure strain on two D crystals exists. That's just not my field. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I have a really dumb question. Yes. When you say flux growth, is the flux referring to the liquid or like field flux? Liquid. Okay. So, for example, um, <laughs> that makes more sense. for example, <laughs> does it have all the uh, material that the crystal is going to be made out of? Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes there's actually a different mm -hmm. flux. It's not something that the material will end up having, but it just it just wants something to form from. Uh -huh. Usually, it is self flux. So, usually, like for example, for europium aluminum four, you put um, the like the the ratio I use is one to one to no, one to 16, right? One to 16. So you have some ratio of europium and then you have to have 16 times that of aluminum because you, you just want a bunch of flux and it will inevitably form this phase. You can look at like the, the like chemical phase diagrams to see what- you have that in liquid form? Well, no, I mean, you put it in a furnace, it's going to melt, right? Right. No, I was thinking that be, uh, how hot is it? Uh, so these samples, I bring them up to 1100 degrees Celsius. Cool. And they stay there for like a couple of days. That's great. They stay at 1100 degrees Celsius for a couple of days. Yeah. And then you bring them down and you spin them out. So you get rid of all the flux. It's cool stuff. Yeah, I could talk about that too. I just feel like that's not a journal club talk. <laughs> I'm glad that we have an experiment. <laughs> yeah. so you're like, well, we have a crystal that's exactly perfect. <laughs> now we took out exactly one out. Um, yeah. All right. We can. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, cool.